good. All right. Well, this morning, we'll put that first screen up. We've been talking for the past couple of weeks about courage, about the legacy that we have and can leave behind of courage. And we've been talking about walking in our inheritance with spiritual courage. So this morning's quote, which I sometimes, oftentimes will do, comes from Winston Churchill. Okay? But here's what he says. Success is not final. Failure is not fatal. It is the courage to continue that counts. Just let that set just a minute. Okay? Courage. We're talking, repeating that again. Success is not final because things can change. Failure is not fatal. Doesn't mean that the end is over for anybody, for any situation, for anything. It is the courage to continue that counts. It's called patient continuance in the word. And that's what we're to have. If we are filled with the Spirit of God, we have the fruits of the Spirit. Yes, we have patience as one of them to be able to endure. God is good. Amen? Well, this morning, as you see up on the screen there, we're going to begin a series that Maybe one or two different times that we talk about Nehemiah. But today the message is very specific. It is very intentional. God has a purpose, like I said. He's going to do a work in here, I believe. He's already begun a work in here, I know. But he has a very specific message for God's people. And it's found in the first chapter of Nehemiah. And we'll talk about that this morning. We'll talk about the prayer of Nehemiah. And what it was, how it impacts my life, your life today. And how we can walk out of here knowing more about how we can again Seek God's face and always see an answer. Amen? So, during the Babylonian Empire, many, many years ago, the entire city of Jerusalem was destroyed, including the temple, the walls, all of the gates. They were left burning and in a heap of stones, it was rubbish. You see, back then, in that time, to destroy your enemy's gates and walls was the most extreme form of shame and denigration that you could do to your enemy. If you could destroy their gates, if you could go in and break it down, break their walls down, you have disgraced them greatly. That is why even, and we'll talk about this perhaps next week, that is why when the walls of Jericho fell, that great mighty city, that it was absolute sheer terror that was spread throughout the land as those walls came crumbling down. 
And then to destroy your place of worship, the temple. It was the epitome of being, if you will, at the bottom of the barrel. The people of Israel that survived were scattered in exile to various parts of the vast Babylonian Empire, shamefully realizing that what Moses spoke in Deuteronomy chapter 8, beginning in verse 11, had come to pass in their lives, in their land. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, if you want to open up with me and read along with me, we're going to begin in verse 11, but this is what the children of Israel thought of and remembered as they were sent in shame into exile. Deuteronomy chapter 8. Beware, this is Moses speaking to the people. Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God in not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes which I command thee this day. Lest when thou hast eaten and art full and hast built goodly houses and dwelt therein and when thy herds and thy flocks multiply and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied and all that thou hast is multiplied, then thine heart be lifted up and thou forget the Lord thy God which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage who led thee through that great and terrible wilderness wherein were fiery serpents and scorpions and drought where there was no water who brought thee forth water out of the rock of flint who fed thee in the wilderness with manna, which thy fathers knew not, that he might humble thee and that he might prove thee to do thee good at thy latter end. And thou say in thine heart, my power and the might of my hand has gotten me this wealth. But thou shalt remember the Lord thy God, for it is he that giveth thee power to get wealth, and that he may establish his covenant, which he swear unto thy fathers as it is this day. Verse 19, and it shall be, if thou do at all forget the Lord thy God and walk after other gods and serve them and worship them I testify against you this day that you shall surely perish as the nations which the Lord destroyed before your face so shall you perish because you would not be obedient unto the voice of the Lord your God this is how he began that chapter, that part of his speech in Deuteronomy 8. But if you go through chapter 9, chapter 10, chapter 11, it's a good read. Because in that, it declares chapter after chapter of the promises of God and the great expectations that each and every one of them could be looking forward to in this land that God had promised to his people. But he began with a warning. He began with a plea to understand the clean fear of God. That there are consequences that if you choose to not obey, if you choose to disobey, to follow after other gods. You have made your choice and God has already spoken. There's judgment. But God is a God of mercy. But he is also a God of judgment. So then, as we read 
in the book of Ezra, which is the chapter, the book just before Nehemiah. We read in the book of Ezra how after the Persian Empire conquered the Babylonians, the children of Israel, who were still in exile, gained favor through the proclamation of the king of Persia. His name was Cyrus. That king proclaimed to the children of Israel that they be allowed to go back and rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. God had mercy. Again, because that's God's way. It is known that it was Zerubbabel who led the first group of captives back to Jerusalem. And for about 20 years, he set about reconstructing the temple on the old site. Finally, temple worship was reinstated through the prophets' help, the prophets uh, Zechariah and Haggai, until it had to stop because the enemy again, speaking lies, speaking things to that king. At that time, the king had become, the uh, Persian king was Artaxerxes. And he, in Ezra 4, 21, commanded every man to cease until further commandment. And so the rebuilding and the restoration of Jerusalem was temporarily stopped until Nehemiah prayed. For today, I want us to begin in this series on Nehemiah by simply reading the first 11 verses of that chapter. And then we'll go back and see how and why Nehemiah's prayer relates to you and I right now here today. You ready? Let's open to Nehemiah chapter 1. Beginning in the first verse, it says the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. And it came to pass in the month Chislu, in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan the citadel, that's the palace, that Hanai, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. Verse 3, and they said unto me, the remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. And it came to pass when I heard these words, when Nehemiah heard those words, that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. And I said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. Let thy ear now be attentive and thy eyes open that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant which I pray before thee now, day and night, for the children of Israel, thy servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee. Both I and my father's house have sinned. We have dealt, verse 7, we have dealt very corruptly against thee and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments which thou commanded thy servant Moses. 
Verse 8, remember, I beseech thee, the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, if ye transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. But, verse 9, but if you turn unto me and keep my commandments and do them, though there were of you cast out unto the uttermost part of the heaven, yet will I gather them from thence and will bring them unto the place that I have chosen to set my name there. Nehemiah goes on and he says, Now these are thy servants and thy people whom thou hast redeemed by thy great power and by thy strong hand. O Lord, I beseech thee, let now thy ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant and to the prayer of thy servants who desire to fear thy name and prosper, I pray thee, thy servant this day and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. For I was the king's cupbearer. So what made Nehemiah's prayer so special that it moved God's heart in such an amazing way? Let's put up that next screen. The first thing that moved God in that prayer, that simple prayer that Nehemiah prayed was praise. In verse 5 of that chapter, we read and said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. Nehemiah begins by giving God Almighty praise. The same way Jesus instructed his disciples when they came to him, and we can read it in Luke chapter 11 and in Matthew chapter 6. The disciples came to Jesus and they said, Lord, teach us how to pray. And Jesus said, okay, after this manner, then here is how you approach and understand how to pray. It began, our Father, who is in heaven, holy is your name. Hallowed be thy name. He began in that example of how we were to open our prayer closets, open our conversations with our maker. And he said, acknowledge praise and holiness that our God is good. Amen? Remember, Nehemiah prayed this after the Israelites were released from 70 years of Babylonian captivity by praising God for always keeping his promises Nehemiah is declaring God's character and using it as a basis to ask God to intervene always remind the Lord of what he has promised second Next screen, please. Petition. How is it that this prayer was so significant? It was through petition. It was through asking. Wow, imagine that. Letting something come out of your mouth that you ask and petition your father for. As children, when you were young, if you can remember that far back, okay? As we were children, it 
wouldn't have been any big deal for most of us to come to your father and ask him something. Hey, Dad, can I get five bucks? What are you going to do? Well, there's a movie I wanted to go to here, and my friend Alan and I, we wanted to uh, go uh, over there on Saturday. You wouldn't have thought that to be something that you could not ask your dad, your father, the same way. We petition Abba, Father, understanding that that's what he wants. In verse 6, the first part of what we read, it says, Nehemiah says, Let your ear, thine ear, Lord, now be attentive, and thine eyes open. That's pretty direct. Saying, hey God, open up your ears and open up your eyes. Not quite that way. But it is asking God Almighty, your Father, your intercessor, the one you have a relationship with. Open, Lord, that thou may hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now, day and night. Immediately following praise, Nehemiah tells God his request for God to pay attention to him. He specifically asks God for it. He is committed to keep asking him for this prayer to be answered. And next week we'll talk a little bit about some of those specific times that Nehemiah spoke to the Lord. At one point we'll read later again Nehemiah, it is written, stops and says to the Lord, Lord, remember your servant. Remember what I am doing here as a work for you in this place. Remember me, God. And I remember reading through those parts because there are several different ones that Nehemiah specifically Petition God to do that. I thought, isn't that a little bit arrogant? Isn't that a little bit selfish? Lord, remember me. But you know, as I thought on those things, I was overwhelmed by the Spirit speaking to me, saying, that's exactly what I want you to do. I want you, my son, my daughter, I want you to declare my promises. I want you to speak. Lord, I have obeyed your word. I have stood in the gap. I have done what you have asked me to do. Now, honor your servant. That's exactly what he wants you and I to do. It is not arrogance. It is not selfishness. If you are doing it in the spirit of God, that my God, I am your servant, and you have declared that I should receive this. And as Caleb even said to Joshua in his 85th year, he said, I'm just as strong as when I went into this land. Now give me this mountain. We have got to be bold to understand who we are in Jesus Christ. You have to know that saved by the blood of Jesus Christ has washed your sins away. And that you are a new man, that you are a new woman, that old things are passed away. All things are made new. That's the kind of boldness that we are to approach the throne, our God, and receive it. Amen? Hallelujah. Next screen, please. 
confession. In verses 6 and 7 of Nehemiah's prayer, it read, For the children of Israel, thy servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee. Both I and my father's house have sinned. We have dealt very corruptly against thee and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments which thou commandest thy servant Moses. Nehemiah openly admits his family has sinned, that they have not kept any of God's commandments. As a true servant of God, he understands that even though the judgment of the sin nature of his brethren wasn't all his fault, okay, that there is still a sorrowful mindset of repentance that is to be acknowledged that in community, in a nation, there must be a respect and honor given to God Almighty. This is so characteristic of our current state of this country and this pandemic, this judgment that we are experiencing. Brothers and sisters, Nehemiah confessed on the behalf of all of the children of Israel. And he said, we. He didn't put himself aside and say, they have sinned. He has put himself right into the hands of God who can make all things new. And he said, we have sinned. This country has got to understand that there is that reckoning that must be realized if we are going to see the victory, total victory in this pandemic that we are experiencing. We have got to realize that there are things that are happening that are not right. That there are children being killed and they accept it as just an option for a choice. God have mercy on this nation. We, you and I, have got to be able to confess before the Lord that we can have a part in overcoming all of the evil that has befallen this country, even us here. Not saying that well, it was my fault or that I believe that it's okay to kill babies or that it's okay to do those things or to encourage lawlessness. That is not what Nehemiah was saying. He was saying, I understand that there is trouble in the land because we did not follow our God. And I want to make a change. I want to pray. I want to petition. I want to praise my God so that when my prayer goes out, that Lord, have mercy. Lord, have your way. Lord, overcome these evil things that have befallen us that God truly will answer. Amen? Next screen, please. Remind God. In verses 8 and 9, we read, Remember, Nehemiah said, I beseech thee, O God, the words that thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, If ye transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. But remember, God, you also said, if you turn to me and keep my commandments and do them, though there were of you cast out unto the uttermost part of the heaven, yet will I gather them from thence and will bring them unto the place that I have chosen to set my name there. Just remember, Lord, you said you would have a people. Just remember, Lord, that I am your servant. I am your son. I am your daughter. Just remember, Lord, that we are called by your name. 
recalling what God has promised in his word is an excellent tool to use when you pray. God knows his promises, but when we remind him of them, he knows that we're serious. Amen? When we take time to open our mouth and declare, Lord, you said in your word that you would deliver me. It deepens our connection with him and it strengthens our relationship with Abba, Father, Creator of all. Next screen. Humility. Again, we're talking about the things that made a difference of why Nehemiah's prayer was answered mightily. We began with praise. We went on to talk about petition. We talked about confession. And we just talked about reminding God of his promises. Now, humility. Humbleness. In verse 10, Nehemiah said, Now these are thy servants and thy people whom thou hast redeemed by thy great power and by thy strong hand. Nehemiah acknowledges God's power of redemption. He's referring back to the great exodus out of Egypt, but he's also confident God will bring an equally successful second deliverance for the rebuilding of the temple and the walls in Jerusalem. He is declaring before his God that you, O oh God, are king. You, O oh God, are sovereign. You alone, O oh God, are holy and worthy. And I humble myself before you, for you are my redeemer, and I'm holding to it. Next screen. The final ask. In verse 11, Nehemiah ends his prayer and he says, O Lord, I beseech thee, let now, now, suddenly, Lord, now, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant and to the prayer of thy servants who desire to fear thy name and prosper, I pray thee, thy servant, this day. Prosper what I am speaking, Lord, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. For I was the king's cupbearer. Next week we'll go into more of that and the significance of that confidence that Nehemiah held with that king and what was done in answer to this prayer. Nehemiah repeats his request in this final ask and he reminds God again that the people called by his name that have been praying for years that what he is praying would come to pass. Next screen. So we come to the big finish. It's found in prayer. John 14, 13 reads the words of Jesus. And he says, and whatsoever... You shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Jesus also says in Matthew 21, verse 22, and all things whatsoever you shall ask in prayer, 
believing, you shall receive. Prayer is the key. If we are truly to understand how to move any situation in our life. Prayer, spoken in your quiet time, in your community time where you gather together with others. Prayer is what is going to move God. We see it in this simple prayer of Nehemiah who understood what it would take to see redemption of a situation that they had brought upon themselves, but trusting a God who said, I will see restoration for your life, for I am the Lord that heals you. I am the Lord that delivers you. I am, he said, that is my name. I am God Almighty. Next screen. So as a house of prayer, that is exactly what we are going to do here this morning. Isaiah 56, verse 7. You can bring that uh, scripture. I didn't write that down, but if you can, bring that up on the board. Isaiah 56, and verse 7. Isaiah 56 and verse 7. Let's read it together. Even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. And truly that is the vision that we have that is written as a part of this church, a part of this house, that as a community of believers, all different in many, many different respects, finding that there is great unity in all of our diversity, we can come together as one to pray. Because God is faithful. These points that I brought out about Nehemiah's prayer are simply guides to help us understand that the elements of praise and repentance based in humility are essential to any prayer. We must humble ourselves before our mighty God and acknowledge who he is and who we are declared to be, anointed with his power and his love for us. James 5, verse 16, reminds us, tells us that the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man or woman or child avails much. In other words, prayer works. We have seen it happen again and again and again. Our God is moved by prayer because without God we can do nothing, but without us, He will do nothing. We are vessels in the hand of God that can be used 
if we surrender and we allow God to truly mold us, if we truly will die. You say, what do you mean? I mean die to ourselves. Just as it means when you are baptized in water after you have been saved and you've surrendered your life to the Lord Jesus Christ and you've asked him to forgive you and to cleanse you by the washing of the blood in baptism you are submerged you are put under you are under the water only to come out brand new a new creature the old things are left in that death in that water great symbolism in Jesus Christ himself our Lord and Savior allowed himself to be baptized imagine what an example In Matthew 18, verse 18, we've read it before, but it's powerful. And as we seek our God in prayer this morning, I want us to remember these verses. Mike, if you'll come up and play some soft music here. Matthew 18, 18 starts off and it says verily, which means truly, which means boy, if there's something that you should get, listen now. Jesus was saying, I'm telling you whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father, which is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst. Oh, that's powerful. <laughs> Come on. Can we just stop a minute and think? <sighs> Power of our God. <laughs> mercy of our God. The words written in red of our Lord and Savior. He said, and talked about this ecclesia, about this ability of two people that will stop and pray. He said, first, just understand I'm there. I'm right there. And then stop And declare to me to do the works that I've already done, that I've already paid a price for. For you see, I came to this earth, Jesus said. The Son of God came to earth. So that he could take on 
all of the trouble, all of the diseases, all of the infirmities, all of the fear, all of the anxiety, all of the issues of life, I took them. And as I hung on that cross, I made a way so that you, so that I could declare to him, Lord, you took all my pain. You took all my sin. But you also took every infirmity. You took every disease because you said, by the stripes that I received on my back, you are healed. Past tense. Done. And then he says, Start declaring it. Because if I'm in your midst and I have filled you with the Holy Ghost and fire, just as I promised in the book of Acts, the day of Pentecost came, fulfilling what Jesus said, I will fill you with fire, with power, from on high, not many days hence, the promise of the Father, it's ours. And when the day came, they were all filled. And the power of God came on them, and they all spoke in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. These are the promises of God that he's given to us. In Isaiah 55, I'm going to read just a couple more verses here because it's what God is wanting us to write on the tables of our heart. Isaiah 55, verse 10 and 11. It reads, For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, but watereth the earth, and make it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be. That goeth forth out of my mouth, it shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. Power in your words. Because Jesus said, when you pray, ask, believe, and whatsoever you ask shall be done. And when that word goes forth, he promised right here. He said it will not return void until it reaches, until it accomplishes that whereto I have sent it. Whew. Our God is amazing. We also read another encouraging verse in Isaiah 43. Stick with me, please. Isaiah 43, verses 18 and 19. Remember, not the former things, neither consider the things of old. Behold, mm, behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness 
and rivers in the desert. Promise. And finally, turn with me to Romans chapter 8. Because what we talked about this morning, the relevancy, your takeaway today is found in Romans 8, verse 26. How can we, like Nehemiah, pray so effectively? Quite honestly, like Paul says in Romans chapter 8, we don't know how. <laughs> we, we just simply are pretty worthless without the Spirit of God. Understand, there is something to this. And when we pray, we got Romans 8 up. Romans 8. There you go. It reads, Likewise, the Spirit also helps our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we might. But the Spirit itself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searches the heart knows what is the mind of the Spirit because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. He understands our weaknesses. He understands that our English language, whatever language you have, only goes so far. It's limited by what's in your mind but when you let the Spirit of God intercede for you with groanings tongues speaking in tongues the Holy Ghost language that God gives to you when you are filled and baptized with the Holy Ghost he said it opens up and it goes straight up to the heavens and it takes it's like the Spirit of God attaches to those words, to those tongues that we pray, and it shoots them up to heaven, and it helps our infirmities. This day there should be a refreshing and a reanointing of speaking in tongues. It's not a doctrine, brothers and sisters. I'm not talking about it being one of the rules or one of the tenets of faith of our church. I'm talking about it being a promise of God Almighty that empowers you and I so that we can overcome. That's all. God. Move, Lord. Jesus. Holy Ghost. Oh. Holy Ghost. God wants to move in here. And I know that there are needs in here that we want to pray for. But I want us to all truly be encouraged that He is for us. He is here. He desires you to be whole, to be sound, to be enabled with the power of the Holy Ghost.